Welcome to module number seven of the Agile Project Management uh, version 2.0. Uh, in this module, we will look into two key practices, namely prioritization and uh, time boxing. Now, the first tool that we're going to look at is the Moscow prioritization. Uh, now, the Moscow is an acronym that uh, stands for must have, should have, could have, and won't have. Uh, in a DSDM project where time has been fixed, it's vital to understand the relative importance of the work to be done in order to make progress and to keep to deadlines. Prioritization can be applied to requirements, user stories, tasks, products, acceptance criteria, and tests, although it is most commonly applied to requirements or user stories. Uh, so the letters, as you see on the slide, M stands for must have, S, the should have, W, A, C is could have, and W is won't have this time. Now, when you think about the M, the must have, these provide the minimum uh, usable subset of the requirements, uh, which the project guarantees to deliver. These may be defined using some of the following. Uh, there's no point, let's say, for example, in delivering on target without this. If it were not delivered, there would be no point in deploying the solution on the intended date. Another feature, it's not legal without it. It's unsafe without it. It cannot deliver you know, a viable solution without it. So those are the kind of thoughts associated with must-have. Now, DSDM recommends that the effort associated with delivering the must-have requirements should not exceed 60% of the total effort available. If the effort to deliver the must-haves exceeds 60% of the total that is available, then the uh, guarantee to deliver the minimum usable subset is normally put at risk. And the second uh, component is the should-have. Should-have requirements are defined as important but not vital, may be painful to leave out, but the solution is still viable, may need some kind of workaround, example, management of exception, expectations, some inefficiency, uh, an existing solution, paperwork, et cetera. The workaround may be just a temporary one. Now, one way of differentiating a should have requirement from a could have is by reviewing the degree of pain caused by the requirement not being met, measured in terms of business value or number of people affected. So moving on to the third one, the could have requirements are defined as wanted or desirable, but less important less impact if left out compared to the should-haves. Now, these are the requirements that provide the main pool of contingency since they would only be delivered uh, in their entirety in a best-case scenario. When a problem occurs and the deadline is at risk, uh, one or more of the could-haves provides the first choice of what to do, uh, to uh, what is to be dropped from this time frame. Now, DSDM recommends that the effort associated with delivering the could have requirement should be approximately 20% of the total effort available. And the last element is it won't have this time. So these are requirements which the project team have agreed will not be delivered in the time frame, in this time frame. They are recorded in the prioritized requirement list where they help uh, clarify the scope of the project. This avoids them being informally reintroduced at a later date. This also helps to manage expectations that some requirements will simply not make it into the deployed solution, at least not this time around. So uh, please keep in mind that Moscow is primarily used to prioritize requirements, although the practice is also useful in many other circumstances. So in prioritizing requirements, DSDM recommends that the must-haves should take no more than 60% of the available effort in a given time frame, and that around 20% of the effort should be associated with could-haves. If the effort to deliver the must-haves exceeds 60% of the total that is available, then the guarantee to deliver the minimum usable subset is normally put at risk. Uh, Moscow prioritization is applied at multiple levels for the project the project increment and the time box. In each case, the could have 
requirements provide the primary contingency that makes delivery of the higher priority requirements more likely. The next technique that we're going to look at is a time boxing technique. Now, DSDM defines a time box as a fixed period of time at the end of which an objective has been met. The time box objective is usually completion of one or more deliverables, making up a solution increment. This ensures that the focus for a time box is on achieving something complete and meaningful rather than simply being busy. At the end of a time box, progress and success is measured by completion of products rather than completion of a series of tasks. Now, uh, on this particular slide, you have uh, two time box options. Uh, DSDM recognizes two styles of time boxes. One is a DSDM structured time box, and the other one is a free format time box, uh, similar to those in other agile approaches. Now, the choice of a time box style may be driven by factors such as availability of the business ambassador and, and other business roles, or the type of product being developed. Now, uh, a quick word on a free format time box over here. The free format time box reflects the style used by other popular agile approaches like uh, Scrum Sprint. Uh, a free format uh, time box may be effective where the formality and structure of the DSDM structured time box is not possible or helpful. So the focus of our study on this particular module would be the structured uh, DSDM uh, time box. So we have a slightly expanded version over here. Um, so we see uh, a few steps over here. We've got the uh, investigation, refinement, consolidation steps. Uh, begins with a kickoff and ends with a closeoff. Uh, kickoff is usually a sh short session for the solution development team to understand the time box objectives and accept them as realistic. Approximately one to three hours for uh, a two to three week time box. And then as a part of the investigation step, the investigation includes uh, a confirmation of the detail of all the requirements and all the products to be delivered by the time box. It includes agreement on the time box deliverables, the acceptance criteria for the deliverables, the measures of success for the time box, and investigation ends with a review which informs refined, uh, which informs refinement and maybe valuable uh, governance touch point. So this would, in terms of timelines, take approximately 10 to 20% of the time box. And then moving on to the third activity, the refinement, uh, it kind of encompasses the bulk of the development, addressing requirements and testing. Uh, both technical and business testing, the time box products in line with the agreed priorities. Refinement ends with a review, which informs consolidation and maybe a valuable governance touch point. And the uh, time scales for this particular activity is roughly around 60 to 80 percent of time box. And then we have consolidation. Uh, it ties up any loose ends related to evolutionary development and ensures all products meet their previously agreed acceptance criteria. Consolidation ends with a review, which informs closeout and maybe a valuable governance touch point. The time scales are approximately 10 to 20% of the firm. And finally, we have closeout. It's a formal acceptance of the time box deliverables by the business visionary and technical coordinator. This is followed by a short time box retrospective workshop to learn from the time box and to take actions to improve further actions. Approximately one to three hours is spent over here for a two to three week time box.